This is going to be John chapter 8, and I'm going to talk about the subject, looking down the finger of God. If you've heard people say things like, he was looking down the barrel of a gun, then that's kind of what I'm talking about. But if you believe the Lord is who he said he was, then you know it's a lot more intimidating to look down the finger of God Almighty than to look down the barrel of a shotgun. The Lord is a preacher. And you know how rough preachers do. They get down in the crowd and they put their finger in your face and tell you you're a sinner. They call out your sins. They tell you about hell. And that is exactly what the Lord did. So number one, these people looked down the finger of God as he taught. In John chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, it says, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. So he taught them. Wouldn't you like to sit under Jesus Christ as he taught the Bible, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept? Imagine seeing the Lord move his hands as he taught. The same hands that slung the stars in the sky were moving as he explained the Bible, as he expounded the scriptures. Notice it says in verse 1 that Jesus went. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. And if you want to be like Jesus Christ and you are an able-bodied Christian, then you're going to have to go somewhere. When is the last time you went somewhere just for the Lord? Many Christians never lift a finger for God. But the Lord did more with his pinky than any Christian could ever do with all ten fingers and ten toes. But verse 2 says he rose up early in the morning. The same fingers that made the sun and the moon and the stars and made man woke up early in the morning and wiped out the sleep out of his eyes as a man jesus slept as god he doesn't get sleepy jesus got up every day to teach he was a reader he would he was always saying have you not read he read that old testament so much that he knew he was the son of god god manifested in the flesh he knew the scriptures were about him he fingered through those old testament scriptures every day and even called them scriptures he knew as a young child what the bible said about him but he knew he was the son of god and knew the old testament spoken of him but other people didn't but this is how he taught his disciples in luke 24 27 it says and beginning at moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself and Jesus said in Mark thirteen thirty two, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Jesus said, No man knew the coming of the Lord, but the Father. The Son may not have known then, but he knows now. He knows all things. And when you read the Bible, you have the finger of an all-knowing God pointing in your face. It's a mirror. It shows you how wicked you are. But verse 2 says, Jesus sat down and taught them. You have a lot of contemporary mega church preachers who sit down on bar stools to teach and things like that. It's not the bar stool that's wrong, it's the message they're teaching. The Lord sat down and taught, maybe on a rock or something, but the Lord had the right message. He didn't have on a tie. He probably couldn't even afford one if they had him. He didn't have a place to lay his head, but he had the word of God. And the Lord wasn't married, and he didn't have children, but he is the chief shepherd. For me, I don't care if a man sits down in a chair, sits down Indian style, or runs around and jumps on the pews. I'm more concerned with the message. I'm more concerned with, does he have the right gospel? Is he teaching from a King James Bible? Uh, when Jesus taught and preached, it was negative. He taught and preached hellfire. And that is one thing I like about my pastor is he will preach on hell three or four times a year. He's a negative preacher. And somebody said it's good that I read the Bible. They said that it gives you a positive look at the world. 
And I'm thinking, no, it don't. It gives me a very negative look at the world and at myself and at people because I'm filthy. The world is filthy, and I would do good to listen to the Lord and the preacher when they have their finger in my face telling me what the Bible says. But people do not like authority, and that is why they hate the Bible and why they hate preaching. Matthew seven twenty nine says, For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Jesus preached with authority. People don't like that. The contemporary churches do not like authority. Matthew eighteen eight and 9 says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life hauled or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Those are the words from a sermon that Jesus preached. Matthew twenty five forty one says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. People don't think the Lord would say something like that, but he did. And then in Matthew thirteen forty two, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark nine forty four, forty six and forty eight, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So Jesus taught and preached on hell. And John seven twenty eight says, Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught. So it seems he raised his voice. Ezekiel six eleven says, Thus said the Lord God, Smite with thine hand and stamp with thy feet. And say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. That's exactly how the Lord taught. A negative message, just like Ezekiel. Uh, that's what the Lord gives you, is a negative message. And he says, Smite with thine hand and stamp with thy foot. You hear a lot of preachers, they slam the pulpit, they stomp their feet. I mean, I don't see nothing wrong with that. It's what the preachers did in the Bible. Isaiah 58, 1 says, Cry aloud and spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. The loud preaching and beating the pulpit and stomping the feet is biblical. Maybe the Lord preached that way. Maybe he didn't. But the Lord uses different types of men for different types of people. And some of the best preachers never yell. But they're still preaching and it's still good. But imagine looking down the finger of the Lord as he preaches and teaches to you. In the millennium, we're going to hear him teach in person. But now number two, imagine looking down the finger of the Lord as he is thumbing through the books. In Revelation twenty twelve through 14, it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Imagine being face to face with the Lord when he says, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And although the Lord knows if your name is in the book of life, imagine him taking his nail-scarred hand and running his long finger down the pages to see if your name is there, just for dramatic effect. And when your name is not there, he laughs and says, Depart from me. Because Proverbs one twenty six and 27 says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as a desola as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. That is the holy laughter of God. Now look at John 8.3. If you don't believe... The Lord has your number and knows your deepest, darkest sins and secrets. In John 8, 3 and 4, it says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. 
Now, if they caught her in the very act, then they would have seen the man who was committing adultery with her as well. However, they aren't bringing him. They're just bringing the woman. And in John 8, 5, Jesus says, Now Moses in the law, or they say, not Jesus, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? They're like, what about you, Jesus? What do you say? And notice they may have set this whole thing up just to try and get the Lord to go against the law of Moses. They're trying to find some uncleanness in him. They were, you know, trying to tempt him. John 8, 6, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Because, you know, they want to be like the devil, the accuser of the brethren. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So the Lord knows their sins. He knows that the man should also be stoned who was also caught in the very act if this even had really happened. Unless they're making this up. Should this, this should remind you that God knows your sins and your secrets. And if you don't have your sins under the blood, all these sins are recorded in a book in heaven and you will be judged according to your works. And if you don't get saved one of these days, the Lord is going to thumb through the book, point his finger in your face and have you thrown into the lake of fire. Imagine staring down the finger of Almighty God. Now John 8, 7 through 9. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote of the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. So the Lord knew they were adulterers themselves. They were convicted by their own conscience. A man's conscience is a good thing to have, but a man can sear his conscience. You can defile your conscience. You can wound someone else's conscience. And the more you do a sin you know you're not supposed to do, you can sear it. You can sear your conscience. Ever do something, and as you're doing it, you know the Lord is looking at you, shaking his finger back and forth, but in complete rebellion, you do it anyway. That's how you get your conscience seared, continuously going against God. But next, imagine looking down the finger of the Lord with the dust in his nails. The dust in his fingers is the same dust he used to make man. You know, he kept stooping down and writing something on the ground in front of these Pharisees. And that same finger that stooped down and wrote on the ground is the same one that formed man. In Genesis 3.19, it says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken for dust. Thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. We're nothing but dust balls. Jesus is creator, and the same kind of dust he used to make Adam is the same kind he is riding with on the ground. Jesus Christ left heaven and came down here and got his fingers dirty for man. Second Corinthians 8 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. John eight ten through 11. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. All those men walked off because Jesus probably wrote Leviticus 20 and verse 10 in the ground, which says, And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So both should have been put to death. It wasn't just the woman that should be stoned, it was also the adulterer, the man. And if she was caught in the very act, then they should have brought the man, who would have also been caught in the very act, but it was probably one of the men that was standing there. But they left from the eldest to the youngest, probably because the younger ones had more zeal. The elder ones probably knew they already lost the fight once again against the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verses 10 through 11, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, 
What are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. A lot of people think the Lord is being soft on adultery here, but he's not. He isn't saying, I'm okay with your adultery. He's saying, go and sin no more. Imagine looking down the finger of Jesus Christ himself as he says, go and sin no more. That is the finger of God pointing you in the right direction. Not only does he point you in the right direction when it comes out on how to live your life, he will point you in the right direction about eternal life. In Matthew seven thirteen and 14, he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So he points you in the right direction when it comes to eternity. He told you he's the way, the truth, and the life. And then in verse 12, it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The finger of Jesus Christ is what turns the lights on and off. He is the light. The moment you believed, he did something in your soul. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. I remember when I believed the gospel and the light shined all the way through me. I had a new man in me. I remember when he turned on the light in my mind about the King James Bible and how it's the true Bible. I remember when he turned on the light about this present evil world and then I realized that everything from my youth up was only the devil's plan to deceive me and take me to hell. All the music and the movies. And then Lord turned the light on about all the conspiracies and the false flags and all this other stuff that seems crazy it's like you're asleep and the lord just comes in and turns on the light and lets you see all the wicked stuff for what it is and then you can't unsee it but once you find out about all the all-seeing eye stuff and the evil symbolism that's everywhere you'll then see it everywhere you go you can't even go into a store without seeing all-seeing eye symbolism but the Lord shines the light, and once you see what he shows you, it's hard to unsee it. The Lord knows when we sin, and when we come to him for reconciliation, he forgives us and says, Go and sin no more. If we're going to walk in the light, we're going to have to try our hardest not to sin. And then when we mess up and sin, we need to come to the Lord and confess that sin. That's why in 1 John 1, 6 through 10, it says that if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So if you are out of fellowship, simply come to the Lord, confess your sin, and he won't condemn you or say you have to do such and such. He will draw nigh to you. But this has been John chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, on looking down the finger of God. Are you going to come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are and believe the gospel? And if you've already done that, are you going to live your life the way you would if Jesus Christ was standing right in front of you, pointing at the Bible and pointing at you, telling you to quit the sin that you're doing? Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You do realize that the same hands that made the worlds was hung on a cross and got nails stabbed through them. The same God that made you and made every man that you see is the same God that died for every man. 
when he hung on the cross. So I hope that you'll come to him today as a guilty sinner and believe on him and what he did on the cross to be your payment for sin.